Welcome to Calvary. It's good to have you all with us this morning. Um, we have a special uh, uh, activity we're going to do here in just a couple of minutes. We're gonna, uh, I'm going to invite Allison up, and she's going to um, work with our CIA. We're going to recognize some of our kids who have, who have had some accomplishments. And so uh, we're going to do that in just a moment. But I want to say thanks for being with us this morning. We are glad to have you with us. Looking forward to a good day in the house of the Lord. Let me open us with prayer. And then after the prayer time, Allison, if you'll come up and uh, we'll do our CIA awards. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you today that we can be together in your house. We thank you for another opportunity to just to worship you, to, to love on, on you, and to be loved by you. We ask that uh, as we sing our songs, that, that our hearts be filled with joy, that, that we would be brought into your presence, that we would recognize uh, our dependence on you, but also that we would be able to sing your praises and give you glory. We ask as we fellowship, as we, as we hear the, the word read, as, as we do all the things that we do together in your house, Lord, that we would be about your business, that you would be glorified among us. And especially this morning, Lord, we want to thank you at this time for our children, for our, for our children's ministry and the activities they do on Sunday nights, for the things that they are learning about missions, uh, for, the, for the missionaries they pray for, uh, for the things that they do, the activities that, 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 they, uh, that they lead and participate in. We thank you for our workers. We thank you for our kids. And Lord, as we see them now receive their awards, we just want to give you glory for this as they learn, and as they grow, and as they mature. Help us to disciple them well so that they can continue uh, throughout their lives to serve you and to be a part of who you are and what you do for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There she is. She moved on me. Okay, that one works. Woo batteries make a difference, everyone. Okay, Wendy, why don't you come on up here with me? All right. So this year, I decided that it would be really cool to, to do a mid-year um, award so you guys could see some of the cool things that our kids are doing um, through Children in Action, which we call CIA. It's our missions discipleship program that happens on Sunday nights with our children. And so I'm going to ask um, my teachers, I just want you to see, if you are a teacher or leader, would you please stand up? I want everybody to see this amazing group. Stand up if you're a teacher or a leader, a game guy, a music person, Brandon, yep. You have an amazing group of adults that love on our kids at Calvary, and we are so blessed we are so blessed by that. And so we're going to be giving out some awards today that the kids have earned. Um, they have little backpacks that look like this. And each little backpack will have their little patches and the badges that they have earned. Um, so far this um, semester, or I guess quarter or whatever, of, of CIA. And so we're going to start with the little people, the littlest people. Um, so they can go to Children's Church and they can go to uh, the nursery, back to the nursery, because we start at the age of two, uh, two and three-year-olds and four and five-year-olds. Um, we go that low and they have the best time ever. So Miss Wendy is going to help us with that. So Wendy, you're going to call me out a name. Alda, Alda Arvin, you want to come get your patches? She is adorable. So Alda's getting her patches and her new backpack to put them on. Oh, she's so excited. I love it. All right. Who's next, Miss Wendy? Paisley. Paisley Buchat. Why don't you come on and get your award? Is she going to do it by herself? She's so big. Look at her. Here she comes. Come on, Paisley. Come get your backpack. Good job, Paisley. Okay, can you get it? Here's your backpack. Good job, good job. Oh, I'm loving her. I love it, I love it. Good job, girls. All right, next up is Addison. Where's Addison? Addison Buchat, is she here today? Oh, I should have sent this. We'll get it to you after the service, all right? All right, oh, next.
next up is Hudson. Hudson Nash, come and get yours. Good job, Hudson. All right, Nolan McIntosh. Woohoo, here, Nolan. All right, Reese. Is Reese here? There she is, coming from the, down the aisle. Here you go. I love her shirt. It says, hello, sunshine. So cute. And Mr. Bill. Where's my Mr. Bill at? All right. Good job, guys. Well, that is our, that is our preschool and young kindergarten crew. Now we move on to our bigger kids, which is always so fun. All right, we have Remy. Where's Miss Remy at? All right, Brayden. Is Brayden come? There she is. Some of the kids who've been with us in CIA a long time. Um, have already gotten backpacks, and they're just adding patches to their existing backpack. Lincoln. All right. Okay. Lincoln. There you go. Kensington is sick today, but we will make sure that Miss Kensington gets hers. All right, let's see. Is Alice here today? I'm not sure she was able to make it out, so we'll just save that one. All right. Everett Boyette, are you in the building? There he is. Look at all these kids. Love it. All right. We have Judah, Judah McIntosh. Come on down. Helping his daddy in the sound booth already. Good job, Judah. There you go, buddy. Everett Ott. I like that shirt. All right, Colette. Hannah Curlin. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Miss Sadie. Sadie McIntosh. And last but not least, Nolan. Nolan Metz. You know, I found an envelope, Nolan, with a boatload of patches that had your name on it. I found them in the office this week. So you got a lot to um, glue on and stick on. So um, I just want you guys to know some of the things that they've done this year. Just so far this year, um, they received patches for um, doing projects related to Southern Baptist disaster relief. Um, and they've also uh, participated in Children's Missions Day where they put together encouragement to um, give to our school teachers at our elementary schools. And so there's doing projects and, and making people hear and know about the love of God. Um, and it's something kids can do. All kids can, can do that. They're on mission, even at that age. And so thank you all for supporting the Children in Action group. And I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Pastor Paul. We're going to introduce a new song this morning, and we're going to do this uh, for a few weeks so that you get to learn it with us. You may, if you listen to Christian radio, you may have heard it, and you're welcome to sing along, but uh, we're going to let you relax and, uh, as we uh, learn it for you, okay? It's called Holy Forever. <laughs>
today we observe sanctity of life, giving honor to him. I think I'm going to read the scripture before we sing this next song because it, it uh, reminds us that we are his, his creation. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what I think, but I am who he says I am. Amen. Psalm 139 verse 13 says, for it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless, and all my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Yes, sir. 
I muted myself. Sorry, Andrew. As Paul mentioned, um, across Southern Baptist life today, we call uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday. And uh, there'll be sermons preached and there'll be prayers given and uh, identity uh, connected to this. And I want to take just a couple of moments as we start uh, uh, today's uh, message uh, to, to focus in on that. And I'm going to transition to a passage that, that uh, is in Matthew chapter 5. So that's where we'll be in just a few moments. Um, but to start with this idea that we are created in the image of God. He made us wonderfully, uniquely. He knit us together. He knows the hairs on our heads and the thoughts between our ears. He knows all there is. He's numbered our days according to scripture. We are unique and we are special. I had a message last night um, from a young lady who, who made a comment. She's struggling uh, with some spiritual issues. And she said, said, my child is such a blessing from God. And my response was, and so are you. Sometimes we forget to see in us what we see in others. My caution is, where do we get our identity? We say from God, right? And we have this sanctity of life. And it's so much more than the abortion issue. And I want you to, to hear that. My phone is doing something weird. Um, you want me to have that on because that's where the clock is, by the way. <laughs> Not that I pay any attention to it, but uh, it's so much more than just abortion or end of life uh, um, um, issues. It's who are we in nature and character. That's what makes life special. And that comes from God. Where do we learn what God thinks of us? And this is the problem and this is the caution. Because the world will tell you because you're made in his image, whoever you think you are, you can be. And it comes from inside of us and comes out of us. Now, the Bible does talk about what comes out of us, doesn't it? And, and unfortunately, what the Bible says about that is the heart is deceitful above all else. And so we got to be cautious. So where do we get our identity? From God, but where do we learn what that identity looks like? From the scriptures. So every week, on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday morning, I stand over here about where this stand is. And I have about 40 kids in this little section. And I hold up a book very similar to this. And I say to the kids, what book do I have? And they answer, the Bible. The Bible. Question number two, who wrote the Bible? Or whose book is it? It's God's book written through men by, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't teach them all of this because they, you know, I'm dealing with like up to four years old. So, hopefully you can grasp this. Written from God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by men. In 100% agreement from Genesis to Revelation over thousands of years, over thousands of hundreds of miles. Unique time periods, unique places, yet all still in agreement. It is trustworthy for teaching, for rebuke, for encouragement, all of these things. And the Bible tells us who we are. And it tells us we're unique and wonderfully made. Knit together in our mother's wombs. And we are special to God, called by God for a purpose. To receive His Righteous, his righteousness. Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> if you're not with us on Wednesday nights, go back and watch our Wednesday night series. It's going to take you a while because we're not going very fast going through the book of Romans. And it deals with this aspect of God loving us while we're yet sinners. Us not being good enough because of sin. Us being separated from God. But in his love for us, he has offered us Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus' is sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection from the grave. And when we receive Jesus, Romans 10, 9 and 10, do the confession of Jesus as Lord and the belief in our heart, by faith, God saves us. And in that, we are given, being given his righteousness. Not our own, but his. Righteousness is, good, is more than good deeds and good works. Righteousness is not the things you do for God. That's not what makes you righteous. 
I want you to hear that because that's the way we often teach it. And it's not completely wrong, but there's just more to it than that. Because we often just define righteousness as right living or doing the right thing. And that's works. We don't become righteous because of the things we do. We become righteous. God's character na nature is righteousness. That's one piece of, of who God is. And he imputes that to us. He gives that to us. We don't earn it. It's placed on us when we are saved. So we become then the righteousness of God. And it's not works based. It's not about doing right, th right things. It's about the blood of Jesus has covered us. And he's transformed us, given us new life, and he has declared us righteous. So we are in his image. And that brings sanctity, his, to our lives. And we celebrate that. Every life's important because we're created in the image of God. God loves every human being. God wants all of us to become our full potential, which we can only do through Christ Jesus. But there's a lordship issue. We got to make Jesus Lord to achieve that. It's not the things we do from within, it's the things He does from without that He brings to us. And so our value is not inside of us, but our value, well, becomes inside of us, but it starts from Him as He places it inside of us. So our value is God based, which means we need to get the answer from Scripture, not from the world, not from ourselves. Because we can often get it wrong. If you could trust yourself for perfection, we wouldn't need Jesus. In Galatians chapter 3, I think it's verse 10. It says, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Because it is written, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Praise God, I'm not cursed. Because I don't have to do all the work because I'm a child of God in Jesus Christ. And I thank God for that. Human life is valuable to God. And we need to do all we can do to protect it, to encourage it, to love it. And the individual that that life represents in every case. And when life is lost, we need to be sad. When people are struggling because of past issues and, and sin issues and, and frustrating things that have happened, we need to love on them and encourage them. Because their life matters. Each life matters. God cares about you where you are in the midst of your suffering right now. Just like he does that other person. Just like he does each one. He cares about us. And because of that, we need to go to him. And ask for his help. And we need to recognize his goodness to deliver that help. So I want to lead us in prayer. And then we're going to get into Matthew chapter 5. And this is, this is a continuation. We will continue because the sermon comes out of what we've already talked about. So let's pray. And thank God for life. And his blessing of his presence in it. Father God, thank you. That every life is valuable. And we want no lives to be lost because of poor human decisions. Because of sin nature. Because of, of, of intentionality or unintentionality of sin. That affects each one of us. Father we want to recognize that this is so much more. Than, than just an abortion or euth euthanasia issue. That this is about each individual's uh, value before you. And that you value each of our lives. And that we're special to you and created in your image. To become all that you desire us to be. But Lord, we also recognize that the truth of your word defines who we are. You define who we are. And you've given us that through your word, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. And you have said that all who believe in Jesus will be saved. And all who are saved will be sanctified. And all who are sanctified will be glorified. And Father, we thank you for this. That we're able to achieve and become all that you desire us to be through Jesus Christ. But Lord, we also know we have failed you. We have been judgmental. We have been, 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 been uh, sinful. That we have accepted things we ought not accept. And we have done things we ought not do. Help us to do better. Forgive us where we fail you. Restore us to righteousness. Bring the lost to salvation. Bring salvation to the nations. That all may see the glory. The hope that is in Jesus Christ. 
And Father, help us as we look around to see the value in each individual, every individual. Because we are all uniquely made and created in your image. Lord, help us to become all that you desire us to be. And help us to help others to become all that you desire them to be. To make disciples of all nations. Lord, we want you to be glorified in this. We trust you that you can do what only you can do. Lord, we just ask that we'll be faithful in doing our part along the way. Help us to understand that our righteousness is not our own, but it's the righteousness of Christ given to us when we receive him as Lord and Savior. Lord, help us to faithfully become who you desire us to be. Father, we love you. And we thank you for loving us. Help us now to love others as you have first loved us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we look at God's desire for us to be righteous as he is righteous, to be holy as he is holy, he's imputed that to us, but there's a, a, a course of life, a discipling that must take place so we can become more like him. We're back in Matthew chapter 5. This is probably the greatest sermon recorded. This is probably not the word for word everything Jesus said in this sermon because people were there all day long and it was late in the evening when he quit and he had to feed all the people. But it's the highlights most likely of what was said. And this is, we're looking at Matthew's account of this. And here's what we're going to see. He refers back to the law, Jesus does, and he says, I have fulfilled the law. And we'll read this in just a moment. Fulfillment of the law completes the law. He says, I did not come to abolish the law. He, he, he didn't just say the law is no good and it's gone. He didn't just strike it down. Rather, he fulfilled it. He completed a contract. When the contract is complete, the contract also goes away. It no longer holds the same value it had before it was completed. Jesus completed the law. He lived perfect without sin. He did all the things he was supposed to do perfectly. Including the perfect blood sacrifice, a lamb of God, being sacrificed on the cross at Calvary. So he's going to talk about... I didn't come to abolish, but I came to fulfill. But I want you to hear, based out of lots of different passages, but Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 that I read, we're no longer held accountable to the law. If we try to live according to the law, then we have to keep the whole law. And if we fell in even one part of the law, then we're guilty of the full law. And so we've taken the guilt of the law back upon ourselves, and we are not able to be justified through the law. So we're justified then in a different way. We're justified through Jesus Christ. It's called faith. And it brings grace. The, the grace of God into our lives. So that the righteousness of God can be seen through us. But it's no longer by the law. But Jesus then goes on to talk about six things. And he says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. So let's read these passages together. In Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to look at what God requires of us. By the way, if you think you're good enough because you're created in the image of God, you're wrong. That's not what gets you to heaven. And that's not what makes you a follower of Jesus. And that's not what makes you able to live out the righteousness of God. Because if you were good enough as you were, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross at Calvary. And if you're good enough as you are the day you're saved, then there would have been no reason for him to say, make disciples of all nations. We got to change. We got to improve. We got to get better. At being like him. Because we're still working out sin nature through the course of this life. Even though we've been given a new heart. And a new spirit within us. And so this is what Jesus says. Starting in verse 17. Matthew chapter 5. He says, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For I truly tell you, until heaven and earth pass away. The, not the smallest letter or one stroke of the letter will pass away from the law. Until all things have been accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. I want to I finish addressing this 
And then we're going to look at the six things Jesus says coming next. But I want to start with kind of the end here. Because he says the law still has value. Because it's teaching you a way to live. But the value is not saving you. There's no salvation or grace in that sense in the, in the law itself. That comes in the person of Jesus. It comes by faith. But he says a lot of the things I expect out of you and the way you live and the way you treat others, they still have value. We still need to teach these things. Now the problem becomes here, how do we, how do we balance this out between all the minute issues of law, like how far you can walk on a Sabbath, versus character pieces or, or, or higher priority like keep the Sabbath holy. Well, Jesus goes on to talk about some of these things. And we're also told in the New Testament that, that we are no longer held accountable to the law. But back in Romans, he says that we have become a law unto ourselves to the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, who will guide us. That ties us back to Scripture, though, because Scripture is the one who, or, or, or the, 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 the source that allows us to understand what the expectations of God is. So we still need to be reading the Old Testament. We still need to be practicing holiness. Jesus isn't going away from all of that. But he is giving us a new way to think. In fact, he's going to tell us six things here. It starts in verse 21. He says, you have heard it said of our ancestors, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother, brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So I'm going to move through these rather quickly. I'm going to skip a lot of it. So verse 27, second one, he says, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Verse 31, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife except in case of sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. Verse 33, again, you have heard it said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven or earth, because it is God's throne. Verse 38, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, say to the other, uh, or turn the other to him also. Verse 43, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, in this teaching that I'm going to give you, this is my opinion of how to interpret this there are others who will interpret it differently and disagree with me on this some believe that these six things are, are directly related to Jesus uh, uh, lifting up the Old Testament five of these you can actually find in the Old Testament but number six you cannot it's not there we are never told to hate our enemies I don't believe Jesus is addressing and trying to quote the Old Testament in these some people believe he is and that's okay we can disagree on that and still be friends I believe he's looking at the Pharisees and he's saying to them, this is what you say. It's saying to the people, you've heard them say this. The first five are scriptural. Uh, we can agree on that. I don't think he's trying to quote here because if he was trying to quote, he would have quoted because he wrote it to begin with. He knew the quote. Paraphrasing, but giving the words back to them that they're hearing the Pharisees say. But he just said, I have come to fulfill the law. And so we're no longer under the law. So here's what I think is happening. That's why I want to do all six of these together. Because most of the time when we preachers preach this, we preach one at a time. We focus in on one thing at a time. But I want you to hear a general concept. Because remember, this is a letter being written to the church. A gospel letter that Matthew's trying to get a point across to the people. And I think he's trying to get this big picture point across. You thought, if as long as you did these little things, you were going to be okay. But by the way, you can't even get the little things right. That's just an aside. You thought by doing these little things, you're going to be okay. But understand, when I call you to righteousness, it's not just doing the little things. I want it all. God's standard of righteousness is bigger than our understanding of righteousness. God's desire for our lives is greater than our understanding of what we can achieve and accomplish in our lives. God wants us holy as he is holy, not a little bit holy. Like my socks are. 
He wants us completely given in to him. And so often, what do we do? I, I said this, I don't know, a year ago, a couple of years ago, sometime in the past. It's like when your teenage kids come to you and they want to have that talk. You know, birds and the bees. I never really understood that part. And they want to know how far is too far. Well, here's the answer. If you're asking the question, it's already, you've already, you're already wanting the, to, to, to take it further than God wants you to take it. Holiness is the answer. How much sin is too much sin? Holiness is the answer. It's all too much sin. How, how, how big a white lie can I tell before it becomes a big lie? Holiness is the answer. God saying, I want more from you than you even think is, is possible. Now, he's not saying that because if you're less, he doesn't love you anymore. What he's saying is set your sights on perfection, on the life of Jesus. And don't lower the goalpost. We got a basketball goal up at the end of the parking lot there, and it's got a little crank on the end. And I think we took the crank off of it, didn't we, Jeff? Or is it still on there? Yeah, it's off. You know why? Because a basketball goal is supposed to be 10 foot. And if it's 9 foot, it's not regulation. And if it's 9 foot 6 inches, it's not regulation. And if it's 9 foot 11 inches, it's not regulation. And if it's 10 foot 1 inch, it's not regulation. If it's 11 foot or 12 foot, it's not regulation. Regulation is 10. And that's our goal. And that's perfection. And Jesus is perfection. We don't need to be better than Jesus. In fact, we can't be better than Jesus. In fact, we can't even be as good as Jesus. But we need to set our goal at Jesus, not at some lower exception. Why do the Pharisees do the things they do the way they do them? Because they need exceptions for themselves. And Jesus is calling us to his holiness. You've heard it said this. Let's just start with the first one. Do not murder. Jesus doesn't say just don't kill people and you're going to be okay. He says, don't even think poorly of people. Because your attitude is the same as your action. And so if you wish him dead, you've already murdered him in your heart. And so you've sinned. He's ratcheting it up. He's not lowering it. He's saying we're no longer held accountable to the, to the letter of the law, to the detail of the law, as the Pharisees would have you be held accountable. He, this is said over and over in most of the books of the New Testament. It's no longer about the Old Testament law and keeping it. You can't do it. You're condemned by the law. You're set free by Jesus by grace through faith in him. But even being set free from the law, there's still a desire from God placed upon us to live holy and righteous. And where you thought the law was a, a little bit, the expectation of Jesus is actually a lot. I mean, look at this. Verse 38. You said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, don't resist the evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other one. As one who wants to sue you take and take away your shirt, give him your cloak as well. He's saying, you, Christians, we go the extra mile. We're the ones who sacrifice more. For the glory of God. For the sake of the kingdom. We're the ones who want to sacrifice the least. Because we're more holy. Now you change and become more like me. Because I'm more like Jesus than you are. Paul says if eating meat causes your brother to sin. Then stop eating meat. Well it's okay to eat meat. God told Noah all these animals. They're, they're okay to eat now. Oh Peter he, he, he saw the vision. And the, the meat came down. And, and, and it was good to eat. I can eat what I want to eat. Okay. That's fine. But if you want to be holy as he is holy. He says if you're eating meat. Because of somebody else's sin. Quit eating meat. We got to go the extra mile. Not the other person. Because God has placed his spirit upon us and in us. The spirit of righteousness. He's not lessening anything. Though he's saying the law is completed. It is fulfilled. It no longer has a hold on us. He's saying I still have high expectations. 
In fact, I have higher expectations for you than you have for yourself. The difference now is in Christ Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, we can actually achieve things that we couldn't achieve before. Because the Spirit who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And so we need to be operating from this mindset of victory, not from a mindset of loss. A mindset of greatness, the greatness of God, not a lesser mindset. And so we need to be focused on helping others become who they can be in Christ Jesus as we focus on our own lives and becoming more like Christ Jesus. This last one, the one I told you is not in the Old Testament. So I don't think, that's why I think he's not quoting the Old Testament so much as pointing out the things the Pharisees say, which aren't always true, by the way. Since you've heard it said, love your neighbor, that's a true statement, and hate your enemy. That's kind of like Genesis in the garden, isn't it? Satan was saying things that God didn't say and leading Eve to believe God said them. The Pharisees sometimes said things that God didn't say and led the people to believe God said them. God never said, hate your enemy. He did say, love your neighbor. Jesus clarifies this anyway, so we don't have to worry too much about it. I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be children of your Father in heaven. God as our Father in heaven has told us to be different. He's told us that it's going to be difficult. That we're going to have to live sacrificially for Him. That holiness is what's required. We're not looking to check off a bunch of rules. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. For holiness. But rather it's a spirit. His spirit. That's inside of us. That guides us to become more like him. And he doesn't just want bits and pieces. He wants it all. He wants all your life. He wants all your focus. He wants all your attention. He wants all of your holiness. To mimic his. We can't do it in the flesh. But we can get better at it. And we can set the right goal. The standard is Jesus. And we talk about righteousness. We talk about holiness. We talk about being created in the image of God. We are in our flesh. Born. And molded together. In our human form. In the image of God. That's minor. That is small potatoes. Oh it's important. But when you compare that. To the transformed life. That comes in Jesus Christ. That original beginning that has a sinful aspect, a sin nature that came out of, out, of even, out of Adam. The first man brought sin into the world. The second man, the second Adam, Jesus, brought salvation through grace. The new life, the transformed life is so much greater in the image of God when we are given his righteousness. Than even what we're born into in the flesh. We need to learn to live it out. Like, Pastor, but you're not talking about each of these things all the way through. And there's so much more sermon material in there. That's right. You got homework. There's six of these things. Monday through Saturday, you get to read each one of these and try to figure out how you're going to live that out. See, I just gave you homework. You don't, you don't, you don't like that. But that's all right. It'll make you righteous. Be in the Word of God. Know the Word of God. Old and New Testament. It's important to read and learn because the whole idea here is, God, what do I need to do? How do I need to live? What do I need to think? How do I need to change my thinking? Our human thinking is stinking thinking. God wants us to have holy thinking. And so we've got to change the way we think to model what we're taught in Scripture. And Jesus says, you thought it said this, or you've heard it said this. But let me tell you, this is my expectation. His expectation is perfection. My expectation of the church, this is y'all, is that you bend more to minister to others. Not in, in, in changing the gospel, not in sinfulness, but in reaching out to somebody who has less knowledge of Jesus. It's more about their preference in music than it is your preference in music because God's already changed your heart. The holier you are, the more I expect you to bend. Just be honest. It's not about your will or your way. It's about God's glory. 
less spiritual you are, the more I, I, I expect you to desire to grow in your faith. What, what I've found is the more you grow in your faith, the more you want to grow in your faith, and the more you realize you need to grow in your faith. So we none of us ever really achieve that. But church, hear this. Jesus is putting the burden on us, the saved, the holy, the righteous, and saying you need to become more righteous, and you need to love unconditionally, and you need to go out of your way to meet the needs of others, and you need to learn to think in the ways of Scripture, in the ways of truth, in the ways of righteousness. We need to stop accepting less than God's perfection. We need to stop setting our goal. If I could just be like Pastor Roger, everything would be okay. If I could just be like my Sunday school teacher, things would be okay. If I could just... By the way, if you want to be like me, you've already messed up. I mean, that's like setting the basketball goal at four feet. There's just no challenge there. If you can't surpass me in your righteousness... There's something wrong with you. Because that's not a high goal. It's like when the kids used to get excited because they were as tall as their mama. And I'm like, come on, set a goal. Jesus is our goal. Perfection. And he says, anytime you want to weaken that, come back and look at this. Because this is what the world says. This is what Satan says. But this is what I say to you. Let's take it to the next level. Let's do better. Let's don't settle for what the world wants. Let's strive for what God wants. And God wants you because you're important to him. And God wants you to look like him because that's important to him. And if you're good enough as you are, where you are, Jesus would not have had to come and he would not have had to die on the cross of Calvary. But he came so that you could be like him. So that you could have a home in heaven for eternity. So that you would have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And you would never again be alone. He has come so that you could know him. As he knows you perfectly. And the only way to get there. Is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said I am the way the truth and life. And no man comes to the father unless he comes through the son. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because you will never achieve all that God desires for you without him. And what does it take to become a child of God? But to believe by faith that Jesus is the Son of God. And to confess with your mouth that he is Lord. If you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. That's what Romans 9 and 10 tells you. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Are you living out seeking the perfection of God in your life? Church, we got a response we need to make to God this morning. For some, that would be... Saying to Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. And I believe that you're God's son and that you died for me. You rose from the grave. And today, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I will live for you the rest of my life to the best of my ability. I will seek to achieve the righteousness that you've imputed into my life. That you've given me freely. Some of us need to come to the altar and just say, Father, forgive me for I am a sinner. As Paul would say, I am the chief among sinners. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. God, forgive me and help me to reset so I can live out the righteous life. And I can quit living like the, 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 this person says this. But rather I can live because Jesus says this. And I want the Jesus perfection. We all have a decision to make. Because I guarantee you, everyone in this room has set our goal too low. In some form or fashion. And we need to reset it to Jesus. He's my standard. Is it yours? Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to be in your word, to study together. And Father, we come to you this morning recognizing that you created us in your image, but because of sin, we have, we have tarnished that image. But Lord, you've given us a way to restore to become perfect, to become holy, to receive your righteousness. So, Father, we ask for your forgiveness through the blood of Jesus, through the cross of Calvary, through the empty tomb where Jesus proved his victory over death. 
We come to you today in the name of Jesus, asking for the forgiveness of sins. Asking for salvation for the lost. That they would be saved by faith through Jesus Christ. Father, we come to you this morning, those who are in Christ Jesus, saying we have set the goal too low. We have heard it said that as long as we do these things, we're going to be okay. But today we commit to follow what Jesus said. But I say to you this. Help us to be holy as you are holy. Be righteous as you are righteous. To not accept less than your perfection. To grow daily in our faith as we love others. As we serve others. As we sacrifice where we can. Staying holy and according to the scriptures. But encouraging others along the way. Helping them to grow in their faith. Set inside our wants and desires so that your glory can shine through us into this world around us. Father, forgive us where we have failed you. Restore us to righteousness and let us set Jesus as our standard, as our goal. Father, we ask this so that you would be glorified in and through our lives. We come to you this morning seeking your special touch. Father, bind up the struggling, the hurting, the lost. Restore us physically, restore us mentally, but most important, Lord, restore us physically or spiritually. Restore spiritually that we may know Jesus. Be glorified now through our response during this time of invitation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. As we do, I'll be here at the altar to receive you. If you need to respond to God, in some form or fashion, I'll be here. The altars are open. You can come from membership or baptism or prayer, uh, salvation, just to share with congregation. Maybe a restoration, a recommitment, whatever it would be. It's your opportunity to respond. Will you stand with me? We're going to sing. I'll be here to receive you. the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect faith, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is written on his hands, my name is
quick announcements and a, a short, uh, we'll have a prayer of dismissal. Um, but want to highlight one, one particular thing this morning. Uh, if you're not getting these half sheets that got uh, the thing, upcoming events and those kinds of things, grab one. Jim usually has one at the, at, outside the sanctuary door. They're downstairs on the table as you leave. The table's on your left as you come in. It's the table on the right. Uh, it's got our announcements on there. Next Sunday, January 28th, Senior Adult Dinner. I keep getting asked, who's a senior adult? I'm not going to fall in that. It's like, it's like, you know, it's one of those things. Anyone in their second childhood, if you can't remember what you had for breakfast, you probably qualify. All right? Um, your CIA kids that you saw this morning, they're fixing you supper. January 28th at 6 p.m., seniors. Come and be a blessing to those kids. Come and love on them and let them love on you. It is going to be an awesome time. Sign up so that we know you're coming, so we know how much food and how many tables and all that kind of stuff to present. And I am declaring myself a senior. I've been a senior a few times. Um, Come be a part of that. Sign up for that. We are really excited about this. This is going to be fun for the kids. It's going to be fun for you. One of the things we get asked uh, from time to time is for opportunities for the generations to mix. This is one of those. And so we want that for you. We want that for them. Uh, come be a part of that. There's other things on here like ladies events and, and when groups get together and different things. Uh, so notate those. But that's the big event uh, that's coming up for you this week. Today we have a couple of things happening at 4.30. We have nominating committee meeting. If you're on that, uh, we'll be meeting today. We'll probably meet in the library. But there's also a, uh, a worship uh, um, seminar that's going on into this week at Cedarville. And we got five, four, four of our students, four of our students, this four, not that four. Four of our students going to that uh, who, who help us here at church lead in, in worship. And we have, I think I counted right, nine adults going this weekend uh, for worship training. And so I'm excited about that. It's a great opportunity for us to grow in how we do things, now we present, uh, you know, worship service and other other ap- avenues of worship to you. And so uh, I'm going to ask you to pray for us this week as we go to this conference that we would hear from the Lord, that we would hear from our instructors, instructors and teachers and that we would not be satisfied just being okay. But rather we will set our goal as Christ sets our goals. for To do better. To be more like him. To be perfect. To see his perfect. And we'll never be perfect in all these things. But we want to do better. So pray for us as we go down that road um, for that. And we're going to meet at 5 today too. Get They're meeting tonight. at 5 today. That was my whole point in getting into that. And there I lost, lost where I started. Thank you, Paul. 5 o'clock for that. And... Uh, um, we do have Melvin uh, Wells at, at uh, Morristown Manor. He's in the main building now. I forget his room number, but I'll try to get that out to you. Just ask at the desk. They know where Melvin is. Just ask for Melvin. They'll, they'll walk you right to him. He is like a superstar. He walks through the hallway, and they are hollering out, Hey, Melvin! It's crazy. Good stuff. And so uh, keep Melvin in your prayers. He, he's going to be there for a, for, for a while, if, if not permanently. He, he can't do have hip surgery. He can't put weight on that hip. So uh, they move him in and out of the wheelchair and he rolls up and down the hallway. But he's, he's still got a lot of pain. But keep Melvin and Sue both in your prayers. That's a, uh, we, we have several other on our prayer list. Uh, who do you need to mention this morning quickly? Uh, uh, major cases and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a time of prayer. Richard, I'm going to have you come and close us out in prayer. Bullard, Bullard, Ballard, no, Larry, what's his last name? Tanner. Okay, thank you. I had that way off. <laughs> Larry's sister going for biopsy on Wednesday. Do you want, We had a scare with Brenda Sudarth this week. She went in for some testing. Now, news wasn't great, but it was a lot better than the bad news. And so uh, keep Brenda in your prayers as, as she... It's having a lot of pain in her stomach and just kind of going through a time of healing from that, but didn't find anything super negative. So we, you know, always, always a concern. And so we'll praise the Lord for that. Anybody else? All right, Richard, will you come and we're going to have you pray for our worship team, but also for all of us as we, as we go today. Stay warm, stay dry. If you need something this week, be sure to let your church staff know. We'd love to, love to help you out if we can. Thank you. Still the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today, this beautiful winter day. 
Lord, we lift up our worship team and our church employees as they go about their business. Lord, we thank you for this congregation and the people that make it up. Lord, we lift up these sick, ask you to lay your healing hand on them. Lord, as we go into this week, there may be some weather coming. We ask that you give us grace. Lord, and as we go our way today, let us keep you in our heart and let others see you in us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.